I'm just going to move on with our first session of this Future Landscape Symposium. The session about Terra Nova, a European learning or ITN project. Terra Nova is the European Landscape Learning Initiative that trains 15 PhD candidates in landscape past and future. Terra Nova's mission is to develop an unprecedented digital atlas of Europe, which is compiled by an interdisciplinary group of researchers that combine past human population patterns, plant and disturbances, animal development, and of course, climate change. Now, based on this atlas, Terra Nova will provide strategic guidelines and policy measures for politicians and landscape practitioners. They will prove the strength of interdisciplinary academic research in the Anthropocene and also raise awareness of sustainable landscape reform among academia, among businesses and enterprises, and also among the general public. All of this to, in the end, be able to give input on how to cope with this current change or transition to the low carbon society. In this session, coordinator Short Gloving will, together with early stage researchers Elena Pierce and Alexandre Martinez, talk about landscapes in past and present energy regime transitions. In the second part, Peter Verburg will, together with two PhD students, Lane Felix and Catherine Fayet, present the future of Europe according to Terra Nova. But first, a film premiere of a short teaser about the Terra Nova project, produced by Terra Nova partner organization Film University Babelsberg in collaboration with Libra Film, both from Germany. Enjoy. Our landscapes in Europe have witnessed many changes and transformations through time. With energy regime transitions triggered through the agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution, and now through a green transition in the light of the Anthropocene. What can we learn from the past? And which challenges will we face when designing the sustainable landscapes of the future? At Terra Nova, we want to understand the deep history of European landscapes and past changes in human environment interactions. This knowledge is urgently required to address the climate and the biodiversity crisis. We are a new generation of researchers. At Terra Nova, we are trained to be capable of co-producing responses to the interdisciplinary challenges of land management. Balancing and preserving ecosystem services, cultural heritage and economic qualities. And taking into consideration the ongoing climate, environmental and social change. The results of our work will fuse into an unprecedented digital atlas of Europe to inspire landscape managers who are planning future landscapes. Further. Our research results will inform sound policy making and provide the basis to design future landscapes by new forms of land management, including rewilding areas. This is how we will help to fill the urgent need to promote the sustainable use and conservation of landscapes to make the shift into a low carbon society. Make the future great again. I really like it. Let's start with part one. Landscapes of the future. Understanding past and present energy regime transitions. Short Kleving is project coordinator of Terra Nova and associate professor in geoarchaeology and anthropocene studies at Freie Universiteit Amsterdam. He's co-founder of the Environmental Humanities Center of the International Association of Landscape Archaeology and of the Dutch Transitie Motor. In his talk, Short will incorporate two pictures of young researchers as well. Short Kleving. Thank you, Marike. Very welcome, everybody else. I'm happy to talk to you about Terra Nova. Terra Nova, indeed, is the new learning initiative between humanities and science. Um, it's a great project to be a coordinator of, and I'm going to introduce you today to the project, also with my uh, co-researcher, Peter Verburg, and uh, our ESRs, as Marika said already. So we're doing mapping, and we also uh, think about rethinking 
and we also regard designing. All these three different elements are being touched upon in these two parts. Um, uh, one of the things I'm going to stress here is that, of course, we have many different disciplines working together. And it's also the motto of the trailer you just viewed about Terra Nova. That is many voices, many disciplines with one mission, understanding landscapes together and making a better future landscape for Europe. <clears throat> so the aim of Terra Nova is to train uh, young researchers, to train uh, yeah, young <coughs> uh, e PhD students uh, to work with the policy making and also in the wider society uh, to at least to uh, understand the deep appreciation of many different uh, yeah, opinions, sectors affecting the landscapes. And in this project, we try aim to train, to form a new generation of these researchers capable of, of getting responses indeed from this interdisciplinary challenge of land management. The same responses you already indicated in your ideas for themes on this conference. So many differences there are, so many challenges there are for the future of European landscapes. And in Terra Nova, we want to have ecosystem services and cultural heritage and economic qualities balanced and preserved, taking into consideration ongoing climate, environmental, and social change. Terra Nova has a nice big consortium consisting of eight beneficiaries and 16 partners, universities, NGOs, and companies. We're spread out over Europe, and uh, we're training our 15 PhD students uh, in these different research facilities, and we're also training them to become new landscape managers of Europe. Landscapes give us essential services. Uh, we take water for granted, we take food from landscape, we take energy from landscape, we take clean air even above the landscape, in the landscape. Also, they have immeasurable value as, we as cultural values. We, we get a lot of science also from this landscape. We teach each other in this landscape. We teach children, we teach uh, adults in landscapes. It's also the place we like to go to when we go outdoors, when we have uh, relaxation, especially also in the pandemic period, people like to go outdoors, like to enjoy nature, enjoy the surroundings. And of course, it's also a matter of spiritual resources where people get inspiration. Think about painters, think about artists, think about uh, yeah, all kinds of disciplines who like to work with landscapes. But of course, there are some way questions we can ask if landscapes are not important. Uh, despite their importance for humanity, many landscapes and uh, also ecosystems are presently threatened by a combination of impact, like, for example, deforestation, but also land degradation, urban urbanization, and things we call like human-induced global change. In Terra Nova, we adopt the concept of energy regimes through time, and we look at uh, the devised solar energy regime, which was before the agricultural revolution. Then after we, we adopted agriculture, we came into the guided solar energy regime. And uh, from the industrial revolution on, 300 years ago, we came to the subterranean fuel energy regime. And now we're up to the what we call the low carbon society. So <clears throat> what disciplines are needed to study this history, this, this embodied uh, interdisciplinary history? We combine climate and landscape modeling, and we'd like to gain new insights into the importance uh, of climate versus humans in the development of European landscape. And we look at it from, the, from a, in a deep history perspective, as I will show later on. Uh, we have a strong interdisciplinary spectrum with multiple data types in the research program, which varies from archaeology to geography, ecology, earth sciences, climatology, rewilding, and landscape management. Okay, so coming up to our introducing our first uh, pitch by Elena Pierce, what historic baseline to use when creating a reference for current day landscape management. Shifting baseline syndrome describes a gradual change in the accepted norm for the condition of the natural environment uh, due to a lack of human experience, memory, and a knowledge of its past condition. So is the start of the Holocene, with changes in the land, is this a suitable reference for natural baseline of the past? And what other natural baselines are available for Terra Nova to overcome this shifting baseline syndrome. What are we referring to as well as what is nature? So Elena Pierce, she has a master in degree in ecology, evolution, and conservation. She's based in Aarhus University, and her research project is Natural Baselines in European Interglacial Landscapes. 
And uh, I also refer to her as the project as the dawn of the Anthropocene. Elena. Okay, so I've been asked to talk about natural baselines. Uh, first of all, why natural baselines? We are interested in them at Terra Nova and at Aarhus University, uh, not because we want to try and recreate the past, but because natural baselines are really important for informing future management decisions. So if we have an area that we want to rewild or we want to conserve, what decisions are we going to make will be affected by the historical context of that location. Um, so do we want to recreate a closed canopy forest, for example, like this top picture, or do we want a landscape that's a bit more open, like the bottom picture? And those decisions will, can only be made in the context of natural baselines. So they're useful as a guiding post. When selecting our natural baseline for Terra Nova, we were interested in several things. Uh, this is a reconstruction of North America during the late Pleistocene. Um, and you can see three Neanderthal figures, hominids, hunting prey or, or scavenging from, from other predators. And we wanted to choose a time when hominins were present, but they didn't have this large scale impact beyond that of other species. So we wanted them to be roughly equivalent to other keystone species. So still reconstructing niches um, by burning, hunting, gathering, perhaps even cultivating edible species, but not this, this huge impact that we see of later hominins like Homo sapiens with the arrival of agriculture and so on. So that was important in our natural baseline selection. Secondly, we were thought about megafauna and the role that they play in natural disturbances and shaping vegetation. So these megafauna all uh, existed during the end of the Pleistocene in South America. And this is important because these species would have played a vital role in niche construction uh, by shifting vegetation, by creating a very sort of dynamic shifting range of habitats. So we were interested in finding a time prior to the extinction of these megafauna, um, which on the continent of Europe happened with the arrival of Homo sapiens in the last glacial period. So in finding a time prior to the last glacial period um, with low human presence, but also with the presence of those extinct megafauna, we chose the Eemian interglacial, which is shown here. Um, and it's the most recent um, in proximity to our current interglacial period out of a series of millions and millions and millions of years of uh, interglacial and glacial cycles. So you can see our um, current interglacial period here. So that's why we chose the Eemian. And we're looking at fossil pollen data, um, mammal fossils, as well as charcoal to try and look at disturbance regimes caused by fire, caused by these megafauna, um, and what effect that had on the, on the vegetation and the landscapes that existed. So we're doing this to try and reconstruct an image of the Eemian interglacial to use as a natural baseline. Um, we're interested in how these different megafauna species and fire regimes will drive vegetation, uh, creating what we expect to be a diverse landscape of lots of different habitats and vegetation types, as you can see here. All right, thanks, Elena, for this nice pitch about your uh, Emian natural baseline. And I have one question to ask you, Elena, if you're there. <coughs> Hopefully you can connect Hi, to Elena. Yeah. Hi, Elena, good to hear you. Hi. Hi, the question I had to you was actually, what is, uh, how can we connect this Emian natural baseline to our future landscape scenario? <coughs> so, um, good question. I think the, the Emian is really useful because it provides us with some context. You mentioned uh, at the start of your of before speaking about um, this sort of shifting baseline syndrome concept, where each generation sort of accepts a, a more degraded state of nature um, than the previous. And so I think going back to something like the Emian is really useful as a guiding post, um, so that we can kind of have this context of of what things look like before the large impact of Homo sapiens, so that we can make rewilding and conservation, um, you know, best to kind of increase biodiversity. Great. So you really put this real deep history uh, impact like in your project, huh? which uh, actually yeah. we talked about it future as the dawn of the Anthropocene. Do you still believe in that subterm, the dawn of the Anthropocene? I think what I'm studying is a little bit before the dawn of the Anthropocene, but it's kind of just on the brink, isn't it? So Great. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Great. Great. Thank you, Elena. We'll hear you back. See you in the discussion later on. Okay. Thanks. 
Okay, that was Elena. So we shift now from Elena, from the shifting bass lines, to the concept of energy regime through time. So we talked about the Eemian, which is about 100,000 years ago. But I'd like to take you into the deep history and take a little bit of time to consider a thought which came across to me by Lewis and Maslin, who published also about the Anthropocene, the concept of the Anthropocene, and they published last year. And uh, they, this is another picture, but they said that the first big energy regime we as a human planet, or as a, as a planet occurred, was about 50, 552 million years ago, also referred to as the Cambrian explosion, when animals started eating other organisms and flesh became a new source. So <clears throat> if we look onto this concept of energy regimes through time, uh, we see at first uh, the big, a very old, th more than 500 million years ago, uh, we see that flesh became a new source for other organisms to eat other organisms. So we're still, we're still eating flesh, by the way. Then we have a much more longer time ag ago, uh, we have when the early humans are uh, coming up, that fire became possible uh, when plants colonized land in a very oxygen-rich atmosphere and provided early humans with this first energy source. And then we can put up a third discipline, which is burning fossilized plant and animal life. Uh, that is what we are actually have done since the Industrial Revolution, and that has altered the energy balance of the Earth. Uh, so that's referring us to the question, are we in the Anthropocene? So <clears throat> this is uh, leading us into uh, a, a concept of energy regimes, which of course is much uh, another perspective in that sense. So what we're actually trying to do uh, in Terra Nova is linking uh, our extended landscape histories uh, with innovative strategies for future landscape management. And one way to do, uh, yeah, to get this across is to make a digital atlas. And we have uh, already made some preliminary images for the atlas. We're developing the atlas at the moment. And uh, we look actually at energy regimes through European landscapes. And we look at, for example, available archaeological sites dated mid-Holocene here on your right, on your left, I mean. You see a map of Europe with some uh, yeah, some of these mid-Holocene archaeological sites about five, 6,000 years ago. In the center part, you'll see, uh, for the same period of time, a prediction how climate, uh, how temperature maps might have been distributed at that time. So we can envision ourselves how people were living at that time at a certain climate impact. They can, uh, so we can compare, in fact, how people yeah, were, were changing in that landscape with different climate or different vegetations. Uh, so we, <coughs> and we do this also to give impact to our landscape modelers to understand how people in the past coped uh, with different changes. And we also see this, for example, the, the, the influence of anthropogenic burning on land cover. Again, this fire energy regime uh, in mid-Holocene Europe, uh, how that affected the vegetation. And, uh, and we, uh, this is our main goal, in fact, uh, of this uh, atlas images to look at these atlas images and to look at uh, <coughs> uh, also different energy regimes uh, yeah, going through time and helping us to teach in fact how uh, based on this knowledge of older energy regimes how we should yeah how should, how should consider this future energy regime what can we learn from the past how did people in the past went over these different energy regime transitions and what can we learn that from our current transition. So understanding past energy regime transitions is needed to support and uh, inspire modern energy transition. Um, <clears throat> for uh, By studying humans in the development of European landscape of the pre-industrial Holocene and also to contribute to future scenario generation. Using energy regimes uh, uh, and their transitions is not straightforward, as Alex will show, our next pitch, or Alex Martinez will, will be later. He, but he says that there's a stack of cultural phases is not straightforward. Uh, so trying to sieve out a single transition uh, from Upper Paleolithic to Neolithic with all these different steps is rather an evolution than a revolution. And that makes it indeed interesting, this is research also, that we not can expect, of course, all transitions to be the same and to be at a different, uh, at the same speed as we are trans have a transition right now. 
So I'm going to introduce Alexandrin right now. Alexandre is a geoarchaeologist. Uh, he is a PhD student at, based at the Vrije Universiteit, and he has a strong interest in transition to the low-carbon society. His research project is called Balancing Nature and Culture in Southwest European Landscape Evolution Integrated Legacies, and I know Alexandra that he also has a strong interest in social metabolism. He will not talk about that today. Today he will talk about, in his pitch, about his work on the first energy regime. Alex. Good morning, everybody. I will start talking about the human history of the first energy regimes in northwest of Iberia, which is a narrow land in between the sea and the steep mountains. So the story will start at the last glacial maximum and will end with the adoption of agriculture. So it will span the Upper Paleolithic, the Epi Paleolithic, the Mesolithic and the Early Neolithic. So during the Upper Paleolithic, uh, this population were highly mobile and they could travel across the whole Europe and they used different subsistence strategies. Uh, the first one was a specialization. They used to uh, specifically hunt the red deer on coastal areas, on the ibex, on goats in the steep mountains. They also practiced the diversification of their resources, uh, as for example, the use of uh, um, the exploitation uh, of the shellfish on the fishing activity. And finally, they also intensified their hunting strategies with the elaboration of different mass hunting strategies. The epipaleolithic populations just continued the strategies of the Upper Paleolithic, uh, but uh, they intensified them on the first signs of overexploitation of the environment start to appear. And then uh, later on, the Mesolithic populations uh, were still using the same subsistence strategies again, but in a more complex and organized societies, which means also a more territorial. Um, organization of their landscape. And eventually, um, these indigenous people uh, met uh, new settlers, these Neolithic settlers uh, that came from overseas. And they came with uh, new subsistence strategies that were uh, agriculture and domestications. So both of these people cohabited for centuries uh, using both the wild resources of the indigenous people and the domesticated resources of the new settlers. But eventually, the ever exploitation of the environment and the demographic increase forced the indigenous people to shift their uh, resources to uh, domesticated resources only. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alexandra, I'm going to shift your question to the discussion later on because it's really interesting and you can think already about how your understanding uh, of the long evolution of agricultural transition in Iberia contributes to future landscapes. So soon you will be talking also with uh, Marika and, my, and Elena and myself about yeah, what the answer in this, to this is. Okay, so you wait a few more minutes and then we'll get you in a discussion. Okay, I'm going to finish up my pre part of the presentation. Uh, which uh, says that uh, we need land managers today in Terra Nova. Uh, we just need an unprecedented depth uh, and breadth of knowledge about the physical, social, and cultural characteristic of the landscapes. And they need to understand how their landscapes evolved as a product of both cultural and natural influences. Uh, but interestingly, to, that we, 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 all these different disciplines, we'd like them to, to, yeah, to be associated with these physical, social, and cultural characteristics. Okay, and we need this also to, uh, yeah, to, get to, to understand how these landscapes have evolved. Okay, so um, Terra Nova uh, has these uh, 15 soon-to-be landscape managers that will guide us to future landscapes, and they are working in the reconstructing phase, reconstructing the older landscapes, the rethinking, uh, of these older landscapes and the redesigning of the landscapes. And indeed, uh, this is uh, to also to make our, let's make our future green. Okay, so I'm gonna leave this slide up. 
and I can leave the floor now to Marike. Thank you so much. Should, oh, don't go, please stay with us, right? We're going to talk about all of these interesting issues. Just stay with us. You can, yes. Sure. You've got such interesting things to say. And this is also why I love my work as a moderator so much, because I've learned lots already of this whole world and history behind us that really shapes the way that we now continue and sort of inform the choices that we make. So thank you so much for this amazing work, not just you, but of course also Alexander um, and Elena. Um, let's together with them and also with you have a look at what the audience thinks about sure. these subjects. So head over to Mentimeter, everyone, where we have a few questions lined up for you. Um, if you're there already, you can see that the first question is, what other historic baselines may be useful for providing context for future land management? So the um, possibilities are hunter-gatherers landscape, 12,000 years ago, the start of agriculture, 7,000 years ago, pristine wilderness of romanticism period, 200 years ago, or the mid 20th century, 70 years ago. Um, there's already some answers popping up with the most popular one now, um, the start of agriculture, 7,000 years ago. I hope I'm reading that right. <laughs> so if I make a mistake, do correct me, Sean. Maybe you can also see it. Now um, the start of agriculture is the most popular now. Right? You see? Yes. The start of agriculture is popular, and we see a lot of uh, people also now coming onto the more modern type yeah. of uh, transition, yeah. which is uh, maybe the mid 20th century, which is even 70 years ago. Uh, which That's, that feels to, like really recent, right, in terms of That's history. referred to as the Great Acceleration, which is uh, by scientists, and they call it indeed uh, when th people really, de yeah, the modern world took off, if you want to say so. But we see also that we, we've chosen these four answers also because they're still debated. Right. We see also that the Mentimeter also addresses that there is a, there's a division of opinions yep. and that there might be some... Yeah, some more uh, interest also in these older agriculture regimes, but there's still debate. There's still debate, and you can see that because the answers, you know, they're quite equal, almost divided among the periods. So this is what the audience thinks. Maybe let's also ask Elena and Alexander how they will respond to this. I hope they're still here. I can't see them, but hopefully I can hear you. Yeah, we're here. <laughs> Hello. Lovely Hello. to meet you online. Hello. Good morning. Oh, good to see you. Hello. Um, Elena or Alexander, when you look at these answers, what would your response be to this question? I think what's interesting is that we've got all of these different baselines and they're all of interest and they all provide us with information. So um, the EMIN is really useful for, for looking at a pre-human kind of impact. And then if you look at, say, the early Holocene, when you have hunter-gatherers, homo sapiens, um, and then agriculture, you can kind of almost measure the impact of, of homo sapien communities as they spread. And I think that in itself is really useful. So I think all good, all good answers. You would just choose all of them, right? We didn't put, <laughs> we didn't put a bracket all of the above just to make people choose. Um, but that would be your answer. Um, thank you so much for your input. Let's hop on to the next question. Um, hopefully you can see it on Mentimeter already. What can energy transitions from the past contribute to inform our current energy transition to the low carbon society? Also one of Alexander's um, passions and interests. Um, you've got the choice between electricity dependence, horsepower or fire dependence, or you do have the choice for all of them here. So you can also sort of hide behind the fact that they're all important. Let's see. Oh, this is a more difficult question. It's it a difficult seems like. one, yeah. Yes, people need to think about this for I a while. I guess you just think you get your energy plugged in the wall yes. as for energy, but now yes, you have to think about go. where does it come from, of course. I just had a bit of chocolate for energy. That's also not chocolate an answer here. Energy. For me, that's a really important source <laughs> of, uh, see, of energy. Yeah. I saw some answers coming, so let's possibly head back to the um, response screen where I can see what everyone's saying. Ooh, there's a big sort of, yeah, so everyone's choosing, many people are choosing all of them right now. Uh, that's the fav most favorite answer, with one person uh, being quite taken with electricity dependence, which, of course, I can imagine looking at current society, that that would be uh, something that you feel uh, is important to inform yeah. this change. They're, oh, they're, they're half, half now. Yeah, so half between half electricity half. or all of them. OK. Um, maybe I'm going to go to Alexandra here. Um, oh, someone, fire. That's also interesting. Oh, that's good. Now, 
all answers at least have been chosen once. That's very dem democratic. Uh, Alexander, what would your answer to this question be? Because this is what the audience thinks, but what do you feel? Yeah, I think that um, from the past, um, uh, when we look at uh, energy regimes and energy transition, uh, we are a little bit wider than hydropower electricity because um, there was just not all of this. So we used, for example, the use of solar energy regime. Right. So uh, just the sun who uh, gave birth to the vegetation and then animals who ate the vegetation and people who ate both vegetation and animals. So um, um, we use uh, this solar energy but of course it is based to the development of all of the other energy uh, that we still use today even the fossil uh, energy so um yeah i think uh, all are interesting but from the past we need to understand that the transition between the different energy regimes is not uh, like sh short cleaving already said like a stack of uh, different uh, phases, but it's more like a unique evolution uh, framework uh, that we used and we develop one energy over a previous one and we will develop the next one over our current one. Yeah. So um, uh, I think it is important to look at the past and starting from uh, uh, the agricultural transition also, because it was a way to um, first domesticate nature uh, uh, instead of using only wide resources used, uh, domesticate resources, cattle and cereals. And if we think today we are in the fossil fuel energy regime, but we created an um, environment, environmental impact, and we need to shift our energy regime towards green energies and um, uh, low carbon society and to do so maybe we should use um, rewilding strategies uh, to to try to get back a little bit on the wild resources that we can use thank you so much i'm going to stop you there if that's okay because i understand you can talk about this for hours and i would yeah, love to sorry. listen to you for no that's okay yeah. uh, it's passion it's interest it's really good but i want to discuss one more quick question with the audience but thank you so much yeah. for your input sure. alexandra so i'm going to very quickly move to our last question in mentimeter is looking back into the past necessary to answer global challenges efficiently yes we can always learn from mistakes of the past that i think is important for everyone partly because we also need innovative strategies so yes but also no or no not necessary because we humans have always made the future let's have a quick look there's a yes because we need to learn from mistakes or yes and no because we need both our let's say interests from the past as well as innovative strategies but the yes i think is sort of winning at the moment. Yes, quite clearly, we do. It would be a good thing that they say yes, because if we, they all said no, we could have gone home. Yes. Really? They could. <laughs> so um, it's oh, I think it's quite daring. Someone did say no. Sure. I think that's good. Because you, you said it. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you're entitled to your opinion. Yeah. Um, I think probably all of you, if I'm going to ask you, Shud or Elena or uh, Alexander, you would probably also give the yes answer. Am I correct? Yes, you're, you're correct. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're, uh, our project is actually based on, yeah, on, on studying energy regimes concept and, and looking at other energy regimes. And, yes. uh, and like, uh, like Elena has attributed also, like the, the FAR uh, reference we have from the EMEAN back into the Holocene and also the prospect that uh, Alexander has shown that we have to look at the agricultural revolution more specifically, also how how things were changing or not changing at that time, and what can we learn from that. And I think it also addresses, also looking at the Mentimeter questions, to a sort of consciousness that, yeah. that people are getting more conscious about that we used fire for a long time already, and that we're still using fire. Yes. And that, uh, and that also we're still eating flesh. And, uh, and Which is still a weird thing to me. It, it's a weird. The thing. concept is quite strange, right? That we would eat another 
living, it's, being. It's, it's, it's eat another thing, it's yeah. eat another organ. But it has been in our system for so long that yeah. it just, it's more natural, it looks like natural to us. Yeah, normal almost, whereas it's we normal. would find it really weird to eat our cat. Yeah, right? and we see that we're in an age of transition at the moment, so that people also start to think about the food, for example, uh, they're taking. Uh, so we're also talking about foodscapes, uh, talking to landscapes. Of yes. What do you... How do you want to change your landscapes uh, when you think about these older energy regimes? They yeah. may give you things about how to, yeah, how to do energy in these landscape, but also maybe is, will it be a food landscape or will it be maybe uh, has it has different context, different animals in the, in the for example. Yes, there you go. Yeah. I want to remind everyone that you can still ask your questions to our guests also via the Mentimeter tool. I'm going to um, maybe end this with one question for you. Uh, short, if you could give me possibly, let's say, a one or two sentence answer. I'm just going to challenge you. It's because of time, not because I don't want to hear more. That's all. Um, could you tell me how the sort of atlas that you're creating of landscape history um, brings us closer to sustainable landscapes? Yes, thank you. I think the digital atlas we're developing in Terra Nova is a great tool uh, for landscape managers to refer to how landscape look like and as well also for a greater public awareness uh, to, uh, to address the fact in a very interesting way, in a, in a visual way, to see how the landscape has changed so much already and how we are able as people also to change it otherwise. Perfect. And I love that you're sort of portraying the atlas with your hands as well. It is, of course, something that you're making digitally, but it, it feels like something very tangible at the same time, which is beautiful. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank I'm going to welcome you back at the end of this session. Also, okay. a huge round of vi virtual applause and a huge thank you to Alexandra and Elena.